Well, good afternoon to, to everyone. Uh, uh, well, good afternoon, good night, good evening, maybe potentially good morning to everyone. Uh, we are in this last session of the Oxford Arbitration Day, and I want to thank all the organizers uh, Oxford for uh, having us here. It was an amazing day. I was uh, able to watch uh, most of the panels. Great job to, to everyone. Uh, thank you, Andre, and all the uh, members of the organization. Um, we are, I'm here to uh, do my first uh, time ever interview with uh, someone, but, and, and I have a, a it's not really a challenge, it's more of an honor. Um, I'll be interviewing uh, Lucy Reed. Ms. Reed is president of SIAC, president of ICA, uh, full time arbitrator now, has an amazing career. Uh, has been a uh, partner of law firms, intern counsel, worked for the US government, uh, clerk for federal judge, an amazing, really an amazing individual, an amazing woman, and with an amazing career to uh, talk to us today and for us to have um, uh, the best of her and learn and uh, 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 a lot from her in this uh, hour that I'm sure will will pass very quickly to all of us. So with no further uh, uh, delays, I, I want to introduce you uh, Lucy and Lucy, thank you very much uh, to be here with us uh, today. Hello to everybody. I'm glad to be here. Okay, uh, Lucy, let's uh, let's start with a little bit of background to 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 everyone. Um, uh, tell 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 us a little bit why why law school? Why did you decide to go to law school in the first place? Uh, there's no good reason why I decided to go to law school. Uh, I, that's true. I come from a, a medical family. There are no other lawyers in my family, direct family, indirect family. So it was, it was something that followed naturally from my colleagues and my studies uh, at university. And speaking of background, Pedro, I'm, I'm purposely not putting up a, a, a virtual background for this so people can see that I have a real life. This is my study in uh, my house and I have some pictures of my children and my great grandmother's chairs here. So some people think I probably only do arbitration. That's not true. I'm just like everybody. I have a, a normal a normal life as well. But no, I, I didn't know if I would even like law school and I'm very lucky that I made the decision because I enjoyed it very much and obviously I'm still practicing law uh, many, many years later. And Speaking of practicing law many, many years later, how did you plan your career? Was a uh, plan from step by step from the beginning? No. Uh, again, <laughs> I've said this before publicly, I, I really didn't plan anything. I backed into most of the steps of my career. I knew from law school that I wanted to be on the dispute resolution side, not on the transactional side. And I thought that I would want to do civil rights litigation in the United States. And that also means I knew from, from early on that I was more interested in um, the facts and the stories that go into disputes than the, the pure law. Of course, I'm interested in the law, but I wasn't interested in doing in the US an appellate uh, court clerkship where the focus is on almost all on the law. I knew I wanted to go to a federal district court, a trial court, a first instance court level. So out of law school, which was the University of Chicago, which is a tough place, um, I clerked for a judge on the federal trial court in Washington, D.C., thinking that that would get me into Justice Department or civil rights litigation. But really coincidentally, uh, the judge for whom I work was assigned several big international law cases. And I'd never studied international law in law school. It wasn't really even uh, offered. So I am um, sort of self-taught, but we did um, 
well, connected to Latin America, the judge was assigned a very big criminal case involving the assassination of Orlando Letelier, the Chilean ambassador who was um, assassinated in Washington in the 70s. And that led to, a, I think, a six or seven month trial where I learned about treaties, extradition, international discovery. And I found it much more interesting than what I was seeing about the civil rights cases that actually went to, to hearing. And then there are some other international law cases that led me to go to a law firm in Washington, DC, since closed where they were doing international litigation. Uh, I did some ICC arbitration that led me into the, um, I always say this publicly if there, I can say how I got into international arbitration in two words, Islamic revolution. Uh, it was because of the new Iran US claims tribunal in the Hague where my law firm had some 40 cases that I started really into international arbitration. And then the law firm uh, closed for various reasons and I was invited to go to our State Department, the legal advisor's office and do Iran US cases for the US government uh, and other international um, disputes. So I, I didn't plan it, but I would say that I, I knew certain parameters that I wanted to pursue in my career. So at that point, you had already uh, been clerking for a federal judge. You practice, uh, had private practice uh, with international cases and then joined the U.S. Department of State. Uh, and then you were back to private practice. It was that what you wanted, a private practice? You couldn't uh, envision your future in private practice at, point, at that point? Uh, sensitive question. Um, <laughs> sensitive question. <laughs> Uh, after my time at the uh, State Department, I went back to another law firm where it didn't really, we moved to New York because my husband is a journalist and he had lived, I should have said, at, at some point with the State Department, I was asked to be the U.S. agent at the Iran U.S. Claims Tribunal, the main U.S. attorney. So that required three years living in The Hague, which was fantastic. But then it was really my husband's turn. Uh, in a sense. So we, we moved from Washington to New York and I, I joined another law firm I wasn't really happy with, but then I had this great opportunity, the one sort of big step off dispute resolution I took in my career to be the general counsel of a new international organization dealing with North Korea uh, and the energy and weapons programs in North Korea, which by the way, was my first exposure to Asia. And I I had to do everything, write an employee conduct handbook, deal with taxes, um, uh, litigation. I led treaty negotiations in North Korea, Learned, uh, did a turnkey contract for two multi-billion dollar nuclear power plant. It was fascinating. And it was there I, I really met a wide array of lawyers from Freshfields who were working on the nuclear liability and energy issues. And so I I was invited to join Freshfields, which was expanding its New York office. Uh, and I've told a few people in my life that I really didn't want to go back into private practice. I knew the demands. We had children. I thought, oh, uh, I'm not so sure of this. Um, but I'm very glad I did it uh, because it is, the, the I think, still one of the very leading international arbitration groups in the world. And I, we built the New York office, the New York practice, from one person, me, to I think over 50 at one point with Nigel Blackaby, who does speak Portuguese very well True. and Spanish uh, in charge. So, so I really enjoyed uh, my time at Freshfields, even though I think private practice is very demanding, uh, very demanding on everyone involved. Uh, looking into your resume, we know that uh, your time at, at, at Freshfields was not so um, monotonous. You were in New York, <laughs> in Hong Kong, in Singapore. Tell us more about it. How how did you move from, from one office to another within Freshfields and, and why you did that? Well, part of the why um, explains, I think, overall some of my moves in my career. It's not that I'm that restless a person, but I, I do like new challenges. And what I really like is building things, developing things. So building the group in New York was very rewarding. Um, leading the group eventually worldwide was rewarding. Uh, and we had wanted, at that point, Freshfields was um, leading in Europe and the United Kingdom and getting there in the United States, but still not that well-developed in Asia. 
and my efforts as head of the group to find a partner internally or externally to expand the group in Asia were unsuccessful. And my husband had retired from um, working as a, an active journalist to being a self-employed writer. Our children went to college. Our dog died. Don't feel bad. He was almost 14. Um, so we said, why not go ourselves? Um, why not go ourselves? And that led to the move to Hong Kong for two years and then Singapore for two years for, for fresh fields. And I had caught the Asia bug, if you will, from my work with the North Korean project. So I, I really enjoyed that. Unexpectedly, I stayed on after I retired from Freshfields to work at the National University of Singapore, uh, teaching international arbitration and running the International Law Center. So it was, um, again, an opportunity that came up to move to Asia and stay in Asia. And what I always say to the young practitioners is don't plan too much. Um, be aware of some doors that open and be willing to take some risks. And instead of saying, why should I do that? Say, why, sh why not? Why not try that uh, if you can afford it and your your um, personal commitments allow you to do it? You see, um, I, I think uh, it, it, it brought me in to a very interesting topic, which is, well, you were in private practice this, this whole time, and then you decided to take a position as a professor. And so you became a professor. How, how was it? How, how did it? change what were changes in your mind that led you to become a professor which is something you you carry on forever right it's an interesting question it wasn't that big a decision pedro because i'd been an adjunct professor before and i've had more than one friend um i hope i'm looking at the camera say to me <laughs> when you've when you've trained as many associates as i trained and worked with, I shouldn't say just trained, but worked with so many associates at Freshfields worldwide and in the State Department, that's always teaching. It's what you do sure as well, I'm sure, Pedro. You know, all well, more senior lawyers and law firms are always teaching. So it, it seemed natural to me uh, to want to teach. The, the position that attracted me to the National University of Singapore though, and my main job was to be the director of the center for international law. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that was I could develop my own research in and do more in international mediation, which is something yeah. I feel strongly about after doing a lot of cases that litigating them or arbitrating them uh, where I thought they really should have settled, particularly involving states. So that, that and I enjoyed being a professor. I really enjoy working with the, with the students, the LLMs and the LLBs but I never liked grading. I never liked the admin. <laughs> if, um, if you think law firm politics are difficult, sorry to say this to any academics listening, academic politics are difficult uh, as well. Fortunately, I didn't, it was the end of my career, so I didn't have to worry too much about it. Yeah. I, I think it's giving grades that always set me apart from any academic life and trying to to teach because that that is that is very hard but it seems to me that you were again uh building a a group a team and and a new project when you when you joined uh, uh the uh, national university of singapore so it was uh, again uh the thing you love and and then from there when did you, when exactly you decided to, because you were still based in Singapore and then you decided to move back to New York, right? Right. Well, I committed to the National University of Singapore for three years. It became three and a half years. Uh, I was asked to stay an extra semester uh, while they looked for my replacement. So what was going to be three years in Asia became over eight years in Asia, um, which was which was well worth it. But I knew I really, of course, missed the United States and our, our grown children are here. And I felt I was ready to switch over to full-time arbitrating. It's interesting. When I retired from Fresh Fields a little bit early. And that was, that was because um, our team in Asia was well-developed and in good hands. So I felt very comfortable. 
leaving it with, uh, I'll mention Nick Lingard, um, but there are other people, of course, as well on the ground. And it, it was time. And also, it was almost like a switch went off where I always liked advocacy, but at some point I felt like I just had enough of the pressures um, and the demands that go with, with advocacy and was ready to sit more as an arbitrator. Let's uh, ask you a, a more uh, life question, not on history or anything. How was uh, life in Asia vis-a-vis -vis language? How were how, how are your skills in, in, in Korean, Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> they're poor. Um, they're poor. I wisely chose places where English was the leading uh, language. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, don't, I have um, a daughter who's very skilled in languages. I can't say that I am. I, I, I speak French, although it's quite rusty, but I don't pick up other languages uh, easily. What I, what I thought you were going to ask, what I, about life in Asia, um, the diversity of life in Singapore and in Hong Kong is fantastic, as it is in New York City. I'm not in New York City right now. I'm on, I'm out in Rhode Island, but in Manhattan, like Singapore, like Hong Kong, and I haven't been to Rio, but I assume it's the same. There's just so many nationalities, so many languages, so much food, so much color, so much energy. I've, I really enjoyed that. Obviously, Singapore is very different than Hong Kong, uh, but they're very cosmopolitan, diverse places. Yeah, if you went to stay three years and adapt with with AIDS, it's probably you adapt very very well. And um, uh, I think it the world is getting smaller now, much smaller because we can be anywhere with uh, technology yeah. and we can go to there. So at that point, you were already taking a lot of cases as an arbitrator, but uh, you, you slowly became uh, a full-time arbitrator, right? Yes, and in, interestingly, um, as I don't know how common this is at most law schools, but at the National University of Singapore, I was limited in the amount of external work I could do as a full-time professor. So I uh, didn't carry a large, caseload of arbitrations then. Um, I got behind for a while because I thought I would be done in the summer of 2019 and I had to stay an extra semester. So I had taken on some cases that I, I was slow on awards, although I, I did uh, catch up. The, um, the, I think a lot about how many cases I should handle as arbitrator. And it's, it, in many ways, you, um, particularly with COVID, I think I may be working harder um, now that I'm not going in and out of an office and doing a professor's job or a law firm partner's job because the, the work is always there. Um, and one of the things I'm, I'm gonna back up, Pedro, if you don't mind, one of the things I forgot to mention about my time at the Iranius Claims Tribunal was that little did we know it then, but the work of the tribunal, which were, was disputes, contract and expropriation disputes between um, US investors and the government of Iran, all of which were disrupted and broken um, at the time of the Islamic revolution is the foundation of our investor state practice. Now, the two, Iran and the United States agreed, I still don't quite know why, but they agreed that the reasoned awards would be published and they were published. There are hundreds of Iran US claims tribunal um, awards which is what I was doing that day in, day out. I mean, I worked on hundreds and hundreds of arbitrations. So like many people, I, I backed into stages of my career, but I was fortunate to back into a pioneer uh, practice area with, with the evolution of bilateral investment treaties, multilateral treaties and investor state disputes. I and a few other people already had that skill and had developed that skill. So it was much in demand. I was fortunate to be at Freshfields in those years because we were called upon to do a lot of those cases and build that work. And I do, I try not to do full-time investor state <laughs> because every case is political and complicated and uh, difficult. Uh, I try to balance commercial and investor state cases 
uh, now. I'll go back to 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 that and to the early and foundation of investment state arbitration and foundations of arbitration. But I let me follow another thread here that you touched, which I am uh, very curious to hear more about from you, which is uh, arbitrators workload. Uh, <laughs> I know you uh, discussed and, 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 and studied that a lot. And uh, I, I really would like to at least tease the audience uh, with a little bit of your views on arbitrators workload. Uh, it would be great. I'm, I know that you're referring to um, some papers that I've given, some lectures I have given with the mysterious title of the rule of X. Uh, and the, ru the rule of X is, uh, it's David Karen's rule of X. And when I was asked to speak, uh, for those of you who don't know, David Karen um, died way too young um, when he, a um, few years back, and we had been very close friends working together on the ITA and American Society of International Law. I knew him from the tribunal days. And I was asked to speak at a memorial uh, seminar that was given at his original law school at Berkeley before he became uh, Dean at King's in London and a, a judge in The Hague. So I thought, oh, I'd like to see what David was writing about because sometimes we would write things together. And I found that he had given an inaugural, I'm sorry, a speech at the opening session of the MIDS LLM program in Geneva the year before he died. And it was called the rule of X. So that was interesting. I pulled it off SSRN in an unfinished form. And David's thesis was that putting aside codes of conduct and the kind of numbers that have been th uh, for caseload that have been thrown around in the ICSID on Central Code of Conduct um, reform talks, that each arbitrator should have an individual rule of X, which is the number of cases that he or she can responsibly manage expeditiously and still make a living, of course, um, in order to serve the parties best and that this has to be an individual decision. Uh, I think David pointed out that um, sometimes a professor, one case is too many because of the demands of the teaching schedule. Um, some arbitrators can handle 20 or 30 because they're not sharing many arbitrations and they're just super efficient. So it, there is no one, one number that fits all but David felt that we all owed it to ourselves to figure out what is the rule of X and stick to it. You have to think about commercial, investor state, chairperson, sole, co-arbitrator, um, likelihood of settlements, difficulty of the case, size of the case, of course. Um, and he also said, and I think there's something to this, not as much as he might have thought, um, that that will promote diversity. Because if successful arbitrators dare to say no to appointments, particularly in cases that are smaller than they need to take on or repetitive of what they've done, then there'll be more cases for younger and um, less fully occupied arbitrators. So I talk about, and I have my own, I know you're gonna ask my own rule of X. My own <laughs> rule of X is between 10 and 15 cases, um, depending on what type they are. And I'm, right. I'm, but I'm privileged. I mean, we're talking about privileged people who can turn away arbitrations uh, in, and make sure other people get them. I know it's harder when you're building a career as an arbitrator to turn down uh, an arbitration. All right. It, it is tough. And, and we see a lot of, especially in Brazil, where it's my main practice, we see a lot of arbitrators with way more than that in their... <laughs> Uh, and 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 it's tough to believe. Some some of them do s still do extremely well. It's uh, it's a very interesting uh, it's a very interesting topic. And one of the things I love the most and comes with um, a tip to everyone who wants to read it later. It's the title is great. It's the arbitrator's temperance, and I I love the yes. more 
and I, I love I love the uh, the theme. So uh, with that and and moving them a little bit back to development of arbitration, Lucy, and and exactly what you mentioned that got me and and certainly everyone else uh, very much interested in in the foundation of um, uh, investment through the arbitration and in the early days of arbitration uh, and its development, how how much did it change? What is your uh, view on, on the changes? How much is arbitration? I, I know it's always evolving, but but big uh, in a way, is your perception that it changed a lot? And if so, how much? International arbitration has changed really a lot over the course of my career. Um, and I, just to um, give a year, I, I joined my first law firm in 1979. So it's really been quite a number of years. I realize a lot of my students weren't even born um, when most of them weren't born. Um, what are some of the areas of change? One is it's a much, um, I know it's hard for many people to accept this, but it's a much more diverse it's a bigger and more diverse field. Um, in the early days, it's not just because of the Iran Tribunal, but before the Iran Tribunal, most of the arbitrators and advocates were from Europe. Uh, they're the Swiss, they're the French, they're the English barristers, ICC practice, LCIA practice. Now there are more institutions, much more arbitration in Asia, in Latin America, slowly uh, in Africa. So it's a much bigger and deeper field. A second way it's changed is the importance of investor state arbitration as well as commercial arbitration. And I realized that only a small percentage of practitioners do investor state treaty arbitration, but nonetheless, it's it carries more weight than you would think by the number of cases because the awards are public. Uh, and they should be public because they're, they're making law in the sense of multiple interpretations of similar language and similar situations in investment. So that's, uh, you know, really, I honestly, I remember in my first few arbitrations in my first law firm that involved international expropriation at the Iran Tribunal. I worked for a case against, um, by Phillips Petroleum when it was private against Iran. <laughs> Unless you were good friends with the librarian, at the American Society for International Law in Washington, which by the way is located on the traffic circle where Orlando Letelier was assassinated. So sometimes all things come together. Um, you couldn't find copies of the those early Gulf expropriation awards, Liamco and Topco and all those decisions which we needed to learn. Now you I if I wanted to, if I stopped paying attention to you, I could just go on on Google and come up with hundreds of awards on treaty arbitration. Now, whether all those awards should be cited in every single memorial in every single case is a different question, um, just because we can, but it's, it's just huge, uh, I think. And a third category of change is technology. Uh, we were talking about this before, Pedro. When I first started, um, there was no internet so no internet research uh, at that time. We didn't have our own computers. We were dependent on other people, word processors down in the basement somewhere typing things. We didn't have FedEx. We certainly didn't have video conferencing or even really very good telephone conferencing. So it's everything can be done bigger, longer, and more at the last minute. And that's a mixed that's a mixed blessing. And a fourth thing that I want to mention uh, is we didn't have rankings and we didn't have the legal press. So we didn't have global things like global arbitration review or investment arbitrator that came later with different uh, legal publications. So again, I don't know how much of that's improved things uh, or made life more complicated, but I remember life um, very much before all those, uh, before all that evolution. Uh, what about the, um, you mentioned 
rankings in, in legal press. And I'm gonna go ask you a little bit more about that, which is uh, how much do you think that they help actually, or um, they, they help direct uh, clients to best firms and so on, but there's, it's like, to me, sometimes it's like uh, ranking uh, uh, university colleges in the United States, a lot of controversy around that. It's probably a lot of controversy around rankings as well. How 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 is your view on that? Uh, dangerous area, <laughs> dangerous <laughs> question. <laughs> um, I think uh, that with anything statistical, the rankings that really do fact checking, uh, confirming the number of, in our case, arbitrations we're actually doing as counsel checking with the actual clients, checking the numbers and um, basing the rankings on hard data are, are useful, are useful. If, if I were a, a, a company uh, or a council looking for an arbitrator, I would rely on certain of, of the rankings, but, but not all. Uh, and I know, I'm sorry to say that I think a lot of the research is, is cursory. Um, and not that helpful. And I'm very supportive of what Catherine Rogers is doing with arbitrator intelligence. I do recognize that there is a, a need for more transparency and more information being available to more people on the one hand. On the other hand, you know, at Freshfields, that was a lot of our, um, our intellectual property, our knowledge of arbitrators, of panels, of institutions that we shared internally and you know, I, I think it was important that we, in Freshfields, I'm sure, and other firms still do, protect their internal knowledge, mm -hmm. just like, like any business. Yeah. But I, um, there's too many rankings, there's too much legal press, there's too much gossip. Um, and, they're, and let's not forget, these are for-profit uh, entities. These are for-profit, for they're making money off of what we do. Uh, the late um, Emmanuel Gaillard gave a very good Freshfields lecture where he drew a picture of all of, if, you know, in the middle was a sort of a walnut sized group of actual practitioners, how many other entities make a living off of international uh, arbitration in, in peripheral ways. So I'm, I have to be, I'm careful uh, about how much support uh, to give to them. No, that's, uh... Great points, and I, I know this was a dangerous question, and uh, I always have the feeling that um, this, um, it's very hard, it's hard to, even when they ask the questions to clients and to do a, a good research work, sometimes um, it's hard for the clients to evaluate that. When I, I rarely see this an arbitration, uh, an arbitrator nowadays, but sometimes I see the client very happy with the work of the counsel, and as an arbitrator, I'm thinking, well, it's not that good. <laughs> uh, could be better, and, yeah. and and vice versa. Sometimes I'm there and I'm saying, well, I probably did well, and the tribunal may think, well, not really. So it's it's very hard to to true research evaluate that, and uh, but but it's good that they are there. Uh, another follow up, uh, Lucy, on 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 what you just said. It's uh, Publishing, and you, you mentioned the importance of uh, the uh, international, the state treaty arbitration and the awards being published. But what about the all the um, attempts to make uh, commercial arbitration awards published? Uh, do you have a view on that? I do have a view on that. Um... I'm aware of the, the push and the discussion about transparency of commercial arbitration awards and the benefits of developing commercial law through the publication of awards, just as we do uh, judgments in national courts. Having said that, um, I, I don't think that most commercial arbitration awards are going to teach anybody anything. Uh, and I say this in part from not just my time in, in practice myself, but having been a vice president on the ICC court where I was involved in the Thursday meetings and did see a lot of awards and scrutinized a lot of awards and seeing 
you know, just a lot of awards and a lot of court decisions, most commercial cases are so fact specific and they're between businesses who, it's the old fashioned idea of international arbitration. You want some speed, you want some efficiency, you want finality because there's a dispute over invoices, shipments, cargo, construction, whatever. And there's not a lot of law in them. You might learn some procedure, uh, how the ICC rules are being used, but in general, I, I'm more in favor in what we do now, which is to have sanitized and anonymized important awards out of the ICC, LCIA, and in the future, um, SEAC available to the public. Um, I think there's most of it is, is just not that useful. Yeah. Sorry yeah. to disappoint no. people. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> but it's, uh, I, I know it's probably disappointing for a lot of people. Yeah. What about uh, promoting, uh, because we are talking about development of arbitration and and over the years, and, and the issue, now it, it raises to me the issue of promoting and improving arbitration. And of course, I could not mention that without mentioning your role as president of ICA and the role of ICA on that, which I'm very fond of. But uh, what do you think parties, practices and institutions should do more to promote arbitration? Well, or should, the, should, we, should they do anything? The institutions? <laughs> the institutions what? in general uh, and, and the parties and, and even counsel and law firms uh, how, how to promote and sh should we promote it more and how to promote it? Gosh, that's a, that's a hard question. It seems to me that there's a lot of arbitration. Um, and so promoting arbitration, qua arbitration, isn't as important as promoting and training in arbitration in areas of the world where it's not yet used or it's not yet used um, at a very high level. Uh, and that is the core, I think, of the push for diversification of international arbitration into um, geographical areas that are not well served and looking for more diversity in ethnicity, um, geography, people of color, disabilities. We have a lot to do to expand the pie still in international arbitration. Uh, on, on gender, uh, We've done, it's amazing how far we have gotten for women as arbitrators, women as counsel, women in other roles in arbitration. There's a lot more to go, of course, but the, the conversation is very robust and it's front burner. And that's not true of other areas of um, diversity and equity uh, going forward, inclusiveness. So that's one of the reasons that I um, want to be a leader in ICA. Uh, and agreed to be the, the president at SEAC. Uh, I think those roles are important for expanding, expanding and improving the quality of international arbitration. And I particularly like being able to help the careers of younger and newer practitioners by appointing them, training them, getting them on committees, pushing or pulling them to the front of the stage uh, in, in the, my leadership roles. Uh, I've done enough myself, believe me. <laughs> I'm much more interested in seeing other people uh, succeed and, and take over. But the institutions, you know, it's a, this is another dangerous topic. Some people think there's too much competition between the arbitration institutions. Um, I don't think there is. I think, I think there's room for, for all the major institutions. They offer different strengths. They have different weaknesses. I think there's room for international commercial courts. There's certainly more room for international mediation, which is a different animal than domestic mediation of disputes. There's more room for national courts. Um, we're gonna see investment courts. There's it's a, just a much, much bigger pie now. Um, what I do think is that institutions have a big responsibility to, um, uh, what's, I don't know what's the right verb, um, to do case management efficiently and to keep a, a strong eye on the arbitrators in terms of their, their timeliness. And that's the problem, Pedro, with 
if if arbitrate on rule of X, if arbitrators take on too many cases and they get behind and you can't even find a one day hearing window in their calendars for a case management conference, or at least one day for all three arbitrators, that's not okay. Um, that's not okay for the users. So it, institutions can do more for sure. No, ex ex excellent point. Uh, excellent point. Uh, and it, it is true. It's uh, uh, the way we see it. If we, if the institutions don't promote it, and and in Brazil we are 100% dependent upon the institutions. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm almost 100% of the arbitration is institutional arbitrations managed by institutions. We have great institutions. We use services mm -hmm. of other international institutions, and they they. They've always fulfilled that role of promoting uh, arbitration, but they cannot uh, stop there. Uh, they, they should do, continue doing that, uh, that work. Um, we mentioned, you, you just mentioned a, a, a very a very hot topic for me, which is uh, promoting diversity in, in arbitration and in, in the legal practice in, in, in general. Um, well, and, this may be another uh, difficult and, and dangerous question, but uh, I, I would direct it to uh, what, what do you think that the firms, not, not institutions as well, of course, uh, but, but firms, law firms and practitioners should do as part of their, you've been in private practice for a long time, you, you built groups and teams with fresh fields for the practice in New York and in Asia. How the firms in your view should prepare and work to uh, develop and create more diversity uh, in, in their practices, especially in the, the arbitration practice? Oh, that's a hard, uh, obviously a hard question. It takes a lot of patience. The, the big practices like Freshfields are fortunate that we had people of so many nationalities and that's what made us successful. Um, but that, I mean, no, it's an international arbitration group of over 150 people um, with lawyers from all over the place. The smaller firms have a, a more difficulty. I guess you have to um, take some chances with hiring, go out and look for people from developing jurisdictions and, and train them and have the long view. I think it's important to have the long view. I have... Um, I have concerns in the field because international arbitration, it, you've heard me say it's bigger practice. It's definitely a bigger practice. There's a lot more cases in different kinds of cases, but it's still a niche practice. Uh, it's not basic transactions. It's not domestic commercial disputes. And sometimes I think we're doing a disservice by having so many conferences and having so many legal press and having so many LLM programs where there's not going to be jobs for so many people. And one of, I, we talked about this. One of the things I say to my students was, you may never practice in international arbitration, but what you're learning in dispute resolution will help you, whatever your, your practice is. So, um, so I, I guess it's a question of, um, again, looking past what are the cases today and what nationalities and what languages matter today to what's going to matter five years from now and 10 years from now. And the law firm should be hiring and training and investing with that in mind. That's, and the, the institutions are doing better than the law firms and the parties and the co-arbitrators. We know that in appointing diverse, diverse arbitrators. So uh, they should be applauded for that. But I, one more thing I want to say, Pedro, sorry to interrupt, is 10 years ago, I think I was, um, many of us said we would like to have more, whatever, Brazilian lawyers, more African lawyers, countries in Africa, more Nigerian lawyers, more this Central European, but they're not there. They're not trained. Uh, they're not ready to come into a, a fresh fields kind of team. I think that has changed a lot in the last 10 years. And we've seen that recently in some work I'm doing with the American Society for International Law. There's lots of talent now, lots of well-trained people and on the periphery. And it's a question of like with the pledge for gender, stepping back and looking for people 
they're there now. They weren't there a while ago because it was just this, you know, very European old white practice sort of thing, but they're there. And now the, the challenge is to use those people uh, and find those people and not be satisfied with the same old, same old. Oh, that's Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, it's a, it's a great point because it completes what you said before that the more you challenge, the more diverse, the better is the practice. It was true for uh, fresh foods in, uh, in their practice. If you, if you can repeat and, and do it elsewhere, it will be, will be better. Uh, let's, uh, I, I think we can, this is a perfect liaison to move into topics of the future of arbitration. What hmm. what are because you've been well we've been through uh, 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 investment treaty and and, and the Islamic uh, uh, and Iran U.S. arbitration in the past and we've been through uh, um, power and energy and, and 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 all sorts of disputes. What 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 are the disputes in the future? That is. Well, I think topics and disputes for the future, and I'm not the best to, to comment on this, but clearly there's going to be many more uh, energy and resource disputes with, um, with sustainability um, and environmental protection and climate change aspects to it. I don't think we need, myself, I don't think we need a climate change tribunal well, I think that's too specialized. I just think there will be those aspects to the um, allegations in investor state and in commercial cases about uh, environment and climate change that, that the young lawyers, the developing lawyers, will it, it'll become second nature to them to think about these issues. Um, also, a human, it's a business and human rights issue, of course, climate change. I think cybersecurity uh, and cyber currency are going to be very, very big areas for disputes that will require specialization by arbitration lawyers. Uh, it's not really a subject, but I think that um, people need to know more about third-party funding and the import of third-party funding. Um, I think we need to do more work and ICA is launching a new project on arbitrator liability and immunity because we're seeing a lot more lawsuits against arbitrators uh, as a tactical matter. And it's not an area that we, we really know too much about. Um, so cyber, I think compliance issues are, are going to remain important, not just for investigation, but for disputes, compliance with sanctions, compliance with ethics, compliance with money laundering, uh, bribery, things like that. So those are some subject matters. Uh, in terms of what the new practitioners will need to know, um, much more technology, um, much more technology and how to run hybrid hearings and to get better at um, cross-examinations in a hybrid platform, um, how to, um, when you think about every hearing we have now, it's so easy. You hit a button and there's the document on the screen and you highlight it and everyone can look at it. That's comparatively new. And I think there will be more and more uh, advances. So that's what, and I've always said to the law students who say, what should we study to be good in international arbitration? I say accounting. Uh, you really, <laughs> it's so depressing to them. You really need oh, yeah, corporate yeah. law, corporate law. You really need to know contracts, corporate law. Um, securities and accounting uh, in every case. Let me, let me, and, and I, to be, to be totally frank, I, I love accounting and corporate law, so that's why <laughs> uh, arbitration caught me. Uh, but this is, I want to do a, combining what you just said to some of your uh, previous work, uh, uh, which I found very, very, very interesting, which is, uh, talking about the liability of the arbitrators and arbitrators immunity and which is a very hot topic and uh, and the actions 
and the tribunals and the tension also that exists by the need for the tribunals to deal with the guerrilla tactics of the parties and so on. So there's one side. Uh, uh, this is a is this another arbitrator's liability? Is another uh, improved and developed uh, guerrilla tactic to uh, affect the the arbitration, the procedure, and the parties? And it's something that will be played more and more. Uh, is it true? It's it's also happening. Uh, uh, um, is there uh, corruption because it it grew so much? There are so there there was a, a small niche, a uh, small group of arbitrators in the past. Everybody knew uh, every everyone, and it was a smaller group, more difficult these things to happen. Now it's a very larger group. How much of this is reality? How much of this is uh, have we do we have to revisit the plans to to deal with guerrilla tactics now? Uh, so a lot of questions, a lot of points just to, for you to come and we'll see. <laughs> Big area on on the specific of arbitrator liability and immunity, I'm not sure. Anecdotally, I'm hearing more stories about uh, what seem to be, frivolous or harassing lawsuits against arbitrators. One of the reasons I want to do the project um, in, for ICA is to collect the data from national jurisdictions, of course, to see if that's true or not, uh, and then decide how much study really needs to be done. Um, but it's an area that most arbitrators know little about. We kind of blithely put a paragraph in the terms of reference or our, our uh, terms of appointment that say, we're not liable except for fraud. Um, but how much do we know about that? How much do we really know about malpractice protection? So that's an area for study. On guerrilla tactics, um, you know, I've written, I, I gave my Freshfields lecture on the abuse of due process, which I find to be the most prevalent and irritating guerrilla tactic, um, which is turning everything into a due process challenge in an arbitration, including if you don't get a 15 minute break when you want it. Um, and that it's successful. That tactic is successful if, if, if council makes 20, due process allegations uh, that are appear to be frivolous, they sort of add up and it, I think it can intimidate tribunals. So what's the answer? The answer is for, for tribunals to be proactive and disciplined from the beginning about what they will and will not allow in terms of due process objections during a hearing. I had one panel who said after the first day when I was still counsel, uh, not to me, fortunately, but for the other side, because um, I, for better or worse, sometimes clients thought for worse, I like to take the high road, um, said, okay, just write down all of your due process objections. And at the end of the hearing, give them to us in writing and we'll discuss them all. And it ended up being like a three or four page single space document, um, which well, I won't give away parts of that case, but it at least it showed the arbitrators would listen to it and seeing all those objections in one place made it relatively easy to do so. But the arbitrators have to speak up. Um, and I think sometimes arbitrators aren't prepared enough or know the record enough uh, to know what's legit and, and what's not. But sometimes what one arbitrator thinks is a guerrilla tactic or an overly aggressive position is just normal for that jurisdiction. And the arbitrators have to play interpreter and say, that's a little hot tempered for this room. You know, they can do it out of the earshot of the clients or they know that both sides are going to behave that way and they have to put up with them. Um, yeah. no, that's so. that's a, a good one. We have, uh, we have been seeing, I think, uh, a lot of, uh, with the development in Brazil of, of arbitration in general, and it's, huge boom of arbitration in Brazil that it seems never end. It began booming 10 years ago. And right. It's still growing. And we've seen so so much of the litigation coming in and so much of the um, civil procedure um, top civil procedure procedures coming into arbitration, which is 
uh, and gives a, a raise of concern on how this is going to develop uh, for us. Um, but Brazil has so many good lawyers and so many good arbitrators. So I, 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 I couldn't, I cannot disagree. It's true. Yeah, it's really true. <laughs> it's very enjoyable and they're very prominent at ICA, which I enjoy. That's true. But, and, and for, for, in, in general, Lucy, I think uh, we are, we're coming to, to the end. It's the last few minutes. I, I still want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the future uh, and, uh, and seek uh, advice from you uh, for, the, uh, for the new generations, for uh, how, how do you see and how they... You, you already spoke a little bit about... Uh, advice for for the youngest and the uh, the new generations that we come will come but uh, and you also mentioned the full number of conventions and and there is a there's a lot to be learned for and to prepare for being involved in in arbitration especially international arbitration so uh, any additional advice to to the new generations well, besides thinking ahead and trying to guess where the disputes will be, or not just guess, predict where the disputes will be and to be technologically very agile. You also have to think about data protection now, which is new. Um, I think the most important advice I have for the young practitioners is to be more patient sometimes than they are. One of the things I've seen recently, and I've said publicly, I find it really quite alarming, the push by the young arbitration practitioners to get their first arbitrator appointment. Um, the sort of obsession with, that's what everyone asks, how do I get appointed? How do I get appointed? Ex unless you're in a jurisdiction where you can get small appointments, for example, in the US, we could do that through the American Arbitration Association. Very small cases I started with. Um, in fact, you didn't get compensated uh, for the first day of sitting as an arbitrator for AAA cases or court appointed cases through the US court system. Um, it's, it, you don't wanna be an arbitrator too early because it's a very responsible position. It takes some judgment and some mileage um, to do it. And uh, I've had this discussion with some close colleagues if, if you get, a say, a, a significant ICC appointment or an appointment in Brazil, whatever, and you do it badly because you're, you're too new at it and you're too young to do it, that will stay with you for a long time. Uh, and I see some of the practitioners elbowing each other out of the way, literally, to get appointments. And I think that's a mistake. I didn't start doing it until, well, you know, close to 50 years old. So it's important to develop your reputation as a, a good advocate or a good transactional lawyer, international transactional lawyer, and just <laughs> be, be patient, uh, be a little patient to get into the arbitrator area. It's, um, it's, it's um, something to aim for than something to jump for, I would say. Well, that, that's great. I, I think we have a minute left and and that uh, reminded me of something we discussed, which is uh, being patient uh, and preparing and not elbowing, elbowing your, your, your colleagues and fighting for appointments. But that, that kind of reminded me of the future of all the conferences and networking. Advice for networking for the future generations. Should, we, should they attend all the conferences of course, all the Oxford arbitration days, they should be present there. They are great. <laughs> That's what everyone says. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what is your view on the networking for, for the international arbitration? I think um, some networking is very important. Uh, and to get to know your peers and people um, more experienced than you are. I. I forgot one piece of advice I always gave at Freshfields and um, I give, if you go to a conference, try to think about one, giving one intervention that's thoughtful, not 10, not five, not zero, but one. And then people will remember you for that. Try to work on one article 
that's really a thought provoking piece to get published. It could be a blog, it could be an article. Work with somebody else. Have a co-writer. That's always more. That's always more fun. Um, and look out for your friends. Uh, talk up your friends. Uh, networking. It's um, my world from the Iran U.S. Claims Tribunal. We're now quite old, but we all still know each other, and we've we've opened a lot of doors for each other. And the modern day equivalent of that, I think, is the conferences. So don't go to too many. Make an impact, a modest one, in the ones that you go to, uh, and be thought of as uh, a thoughtful, a thoughtful person. But definitely look out for your friends and always give a leg up, um, is what I say. That, that, that was great. Lucia, I could go on for hours, as you know, already. Um, but I think it's, that's it. I think we are about time. I want to thank you very, very much. Uh, for your time and for all the answers and going through all this with me uh, today. I want to thank uh, the organization, uh, the sixth uh, Oxford Arbitration Day. It was great. It was a privilege and honor uh, to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and for people listening. I'm, it's my first exposure to the Oxford Arbitration Day. Very glad it's a day and not a week. Um, <laughs> as I say, focus. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, it was enjoyable. It was great. Thank you very much.